I have a paper. Um, so there's a little background to this Hello Kitty image, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, I, I do want to talk about Dragon a little bit, just give you a little bit, a little bit of background, and say that probably it was five or maybe six years ago that I first met Dragon, and um, the quality of his conversation, the kinds of talks that we had, uh, were really, really intriguing to me. The work that he was doing and the um, and just the ideas and the, and the enthusiasm that he was bringing to something about which I knew virtually nothing. Um, and so I brought him into my class, my MFA class here, and um, we, had, we had such a great time and it was a really, really interesting uh, lecture, it was an interesting conversation that in the back of my mind I had the idea that someday I would bring him back and hopefully to speak to a group that was a little larger than just the, the 11 people in, in my seminar. Um, so now we have an opportunity to do that. Um, the other thing about it was that um, I'm, I'm super interested in this topic because as someone who grew up sort of, I mean I was older, but grew up professionally as the web was developing and just as, as the whole idea of uh, digital communication was developing, I kind of looked on this with interest. Um, and sometimes frustration, uh, as someone who wanted transparency and wanted everything to happen all at once, but at the same time, not with the kind of inspiration that digital artists and people like Dragan uh, embraced that, certainly the early web, and um, up to a point in its development. So I was intrigued by the notion, A, that the web has, or, or that digital communication has a, has a long prehistory, and also that as it developed through the 90s and into the early 2000s, um, it also has a nostalgia. And as we talked about that, um, I, was, I was intrigued at the whole idea of preserving uh, the kinds of initiatives and the kinds of artistic activity that were happening in places that certainly for someone like me, uh, who was only interested in very practical aspects of the web, had no idea that this stuff was going on. So it's wonderful to be able to re-engage that um, so I just want to say a couple of things about Dragan, so a little background. Uh, he was born in Germany, 75, he's a musician, an artist, and a researcher. This is all boilerplate, okay? So, uh, since 2014, he's led the preservation department at Rhizome, um, which many of you know. Uh, that's the digital art organization that holds a collection of more than 2,000 pieces of, of net art. Um, well, that's kind of an interesting idea, to hold a collection of net art. Uh, Rhizome has worked closely with the new museum. In this position, uh, Dragon's established emulation, web archiving, and linked data as institutional practices. It's going to be, this is basically going to be standard going forward if we can figure out how to do this. Um, develop new uh, approaches for preserving and presenting works of net art online and in gallery space. He's contributed to a number of important book projects, including these are the ones I've just been looking at. An archive of the ongoing project, My Boyfriend Came Back from the War, that was originally started as a net art piece back in the 90s, I think, by Dragan's uh, partner, uh, the, uh, the artist uh, Olia Lialina, the Russian artist. Uh, and also contributed to art Hap The Art Happens Here, the net art anthology, which has just come out. Uh, in 2017, he collaborated on the installation Asymmetrical Response with Corey Archangel, that's a name you might know, and again with his wife, uh, Olia Lialina, at the kitchen in New York. I had the uh, privilege of being able to see that performance and that, that installation, which was just absolutely wonderful. Um, he's a composer as well, and this too is one of his, the grubby corners of his practice. He is the composer of, among others, Zombie and Mummy theme, and my favorite, the Procrastination Polka. Um, these perf uh, his performance involves a combination of sound chip or early home computer music, which he, which he gets from hacking the tones from, uh, from, from PCs and using them to make compositions. Um, and with the Procrastination Polka, there's a web uh, performance with a real band and Dragon on the, on the digital side, so it's really very entertaining. Uh, before he starts, I have one quote from him that I want to read, uh, something that he wrote recently, and I think it's a good setup for what he's going to talk about. So if you can bear with me for just one paragraph. So on the one hand, software seems to be one of the most difficult things to preserve. It is essentially performance, unseizable, unstable, and flimsy. Its ability to perform depends on a seemingly bottomless, nested set of preconditions. 
a computer, operating system, maybe some visual display, a certain input device, even a specific cultural background of the person operating it. In the worst case, it requires the internet. On the other hand, the most viable or the most variable cultural art artifacts are made of software. Software has an incredible potential for changing its form because it has no imperative form. Pinning a piece of software down to a single object makes preservation more difficult. Forcing uniqueness on the object level is a futile struggle against the logic of software. Fanning it out into a larger number of objects makes preservation easier. Compared with eternity, uniqueness looks ridiculous anyway. So, I give you Dragon Espinosa. Well, that was a that was a very nice introduction. I'm very flattered, um, and yeah, I thought I thought I would. I mean, I've, I've also been asked here to to explain a bit how. My artistic practice, before I became a preservation professional, I actually was a like full-time net artist, I would say. And um, so Lyle has asked me to explain a little bit how, this, how these things work together and what kind of insights that I gained in my artistic practice led to what I have um, came to uh, do in, in the preservation space. And I usually am not asked to talk about my art at all, and um, I usually also talk to preservation professionals and so let's see how this works out but I'm really happy to I don't know in, engage in a conversation with you also when you see something on, on the screen and I'm talking something completely illegible please let me know so um, so oh yeah right I find it also very um, exciting to being invited here as a in the photography department, um, which is, I think, yeah, when it when it comes to the to adopting <coughs> digital culture or creating its own digital culture, I think photographic practice at the moment is probably the like the the, the classic art form that has the pulls on it or like the, the finger on the pulse. I'm I'm also very bad with English idioms, so um, I'm I'm I love I love English idioms so so I will try to. So yeah, um, for the, the the image that was chosen here for my lecture, that was without my knowledge, is here uh, my work Lucky Cat, um, and I, I actually also found a photo of it. Um, so Lucky Cat, just to give you some background, is a oh, I have to go here. Yeah, Lucky Cat is a, a teletext page. Um, that I made for the International Teletext Art Festival in which one, of course, the people's voice. It's very lowbrow, but very, you know, it's really nice. Um, and teletext is a, is a signal that is used to be sent in Europe on the television network when the, the cathode ray goes down the screen and then at one point it reaches the bottom of the screen and it goes back up again. And while it's going back up, people were thinking, what stuff could we send? in that time. And so digital data was sent there since like the late 70s and TVs had a decoder built in that would then assemble some yeah, late 70s looking computer graphics from it. And this is basically not used anymore that much. Um, but that's why it's suddenly open for artists to, to go in there because it's all like you know state controlled stations or there used to be um, there used to be tennis scores on there or um, phone sex numbers and advertisements and I mean uh, these are especially interesting because I mean to to create with this type of resolution and color space to create enough arousal in someone to actually call the number that is advertised is a, this is a true, true art um, only someone with a lot of skill can do that but I have decided to to do the lucky cat what you can also do is make it print um, uh, blink I mean Blink, um, and it's basically character graphics. So these are like letters. That's where Lucky Cat comes from. I'm very proud of this work. It was on TV. For an internet artist, that's something exciting. On TV. Okay. Um, all right. But now I want to go a little bit. Yeah, this is a fan sending this image. How, how they looked at it on their own screen, and you see 
it's not it's not really made for sixteen to nine screens and everything is teletext format. <clears throat> okay, so um, I was uh, before I ca came to New York, I was in Amsterdam at a at a bigger preservation conference, uh, digital preservation conference, and was part of um, a group that tried to um, define strategies for preserving virtual reality artworks. And this is a very experimental um, at a very experimental stage at the moment because. Um, yeah, when you think software itself is super flimsy, then virtual reality is like an absolute catastrophe. And I've been working in, in virtual reality already 20 years ago for the automotive industry, actually. The, back then, these were the only people that could actually afford it. So, <laughs> the, and nothing of that time basically has survived. Um, and now artists are using these devices that are made for gamers or whatever else. And um, in a museum context, a lot of museums like jumped on this because it seemed something they could understand because they wouldn't engage with net art of course yeah but they, no. <laughs> but, but <laughs> virtual reality of course great so a lot of them jumped into it and acquired works or uh, made exhibitions uh, featuring virtual reality art and found out that sometimes even before the exhibition would close the work wouldn't perform anymore wouldn't be accessible anymore would be full of errors um and um, so we decided, like with also other people from the preservation community, like to see what, what can we do about this? What, what, how can we structurally approach this problem? And um, so I brought in this work Sara, from Sara Ludi Aviary, which is uh, from 2017 and constantly developed. And um, we were discussing it, and you could really understand that each person would make different suggestions how to approach it depending on their background. So, for example, someone who was used to sculptures would say, okay, how big are these objects here in virtual reality? How, how big are they? How heavy are they? Um, how much space is this landscape? How big is this landscape? Um, and people from like um, um, moving image would say, yo, what is, the, what is the color space here? What is the coding? What is the lens distortion of, um, of the virtual reality headset or so? Um, and I think that is, I, I, I'm not telling this to, to I'm, I'm also not naming names. So this is, this is how this thing moves towards us and you can also push it and then it rolls around like a bush. It's pretty beautiful. Um, but this, this shows really what, what virtual reality is in a way, what computers are to, whatever ideas you come to, whatever ideas you have and you come to a computer, it will always, it will always work. <laughs> it will always seem to work at least, because the the computer itself it doesn't do much. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't have much of its of its own. It doesn't have many characteristics at all. Uh, and so anything that's in the, inside a computer is in generally made up completely. Um, and so you would even have some like success saying, okay, we have preserved all these items and we know how big they are and we put them into a digital repository, a digital repository that is modeled after a paper archive that, I don't know, has been established in the Prussian Empire, like to, to uh, register what uh, young men need to be drawn in for military service and so forth. So, I mean, this, this, all of this works. And you would say, okay, we have preserved it and then we, if we need it in the future, we take these things out and put them together again, like we would do with an exhibition. And, and that's exactly the point when it's getting problematic. Because, yeah, then you have something and you have something stored away in some form that you have imagined that would be useful in the future and you look at it and it has become absolutely useless. Because, I don't know, the software that was there to make this thing swirl around is gone. The GPU, the, the incredibly powerful graphics processor that creates all these shimmering reflection effects is not manufactured anymore and all the ones that existed have been thrashed or recycled or they don't fit into the computer that you currently have and the old computer has been burning itself to death basically because the processor got hot and I mean that's what computers do, they burn themselves to death. Um, the only computers that survive forever are really old computers from the 80s because they, are, they have such low clock speeds, like below one megahertz sometimes, that there's just no heat. And so <laughs> you can also like fix them with a pipe wrench and everything, so that's fine. But anything that is, any system that is able to generate such images burns at some point. 
And also, yeah, okay. So that's, that's just like when you think about what, what, what is projected into, into the computer and into, net, into networks, what you, you kind of understand that computer culture is kind of more important than what the computer actually is doing. Um, and so, after showing you the teletext piece, I will just show you two more artworks that I've been involved with. Um, so this is another one that I did together with Olya Jalina. It's pretty recent. In internet years, of course, this is like a uh, hundred years ago. So what we did in 2011 is um, <clears throat> we took three, at that time, um, dominant social network sites and re-implemented them in this, as we say here, with the spirit and technology of 1997. Um, so this is a um, this is a Netscape for um, running on Windows 95, and we made like complete new versions of Facebook and YouTube uh, and Google Plus and also of Pinterest. And um, <clears throat> there is there are a few screenshots. So this this. These networks actually work. So you can log on and create an account and say, I'm, that's my name, here's my photo, and you can talk to each other. We just limited the transmission speed to four kilobytes per second. And also, the, um, the um, of course, all the interface and so forth is really optimized for that specific browser, Netscape, for the browser that was announced by Netscape Corporation back then at the moment. The desktop is dead. Everything will happen on the internet. This had pretty, like, okay JavaScript capabilities. So you could click buttons and stuff would appear, and frames would reload and everything. And um, what I really like about this is that Google, the actual Google Plus is dead already. Google turned it off. Um, <laughs> and our Google Plus still exists. And um, so these are the circles here, of course. If you even remember that Google Plus had circles at some point in which you can, could arrange your friends. Of course, back at that time, it wasn't possible, so it had to be squares. Um, but yeah, we had, we had like, um, did, it, it got some newspaper attention, and we got 20,000 users on this network, um, on, the, on the Facebook version. So I'm showing you a few beautiful screens. So it has all the user management and everything. It's absolutely there. Just with, like, the interface paradigms and, uh, yeah. <clears throat> Which one is nice? Yeah, here this is how you edit your profile. Okay, and um, I I really like YouTube because I mean the main thing that so we put like some cinematic thing here instead of the <laughs> instead of the uh, the, um, the TV screen, um, because what what YouTube essentially did was it took away all the burden of people to convert the videos into format that the actual users in the end could see because every computer had. Is, there was absolutely no, no standard. Every computer was installed differently, and so we thought, okay, if YouTube existed back then, you would kind of need to select what kind of container format you want, what kind of video encoder you want, so that you can actually see that in your computer. Um, let's see. And we, of course, we put there the absolute classics. And, um, yeah, here, also um, computer graphics from that time, computer graphic demos. <clears throat> and yeah, you, there is even a way to embed it in your own frame set, which I mean, yeah. So these are all, these, these are, this is all like Facebook, I think, I'm very proud of Facebook too, because it has, it's a real book here. And <clears throat> you can, you have a grid, you can only have 16 friends <laughs> here on a grid, which I think is, I mean, it's okay. And here it would populate and... Um, you could you upvote and then some fireworks would go off and stuff. So I, I mean, I really would, I really encourage you to to use it. Also, I mean, you can make sure this, there's guaranteed no AI so surveying what you're doing there. There's no data-driven commercials or whatever. Um, yeah, but yeah, you can. There are also some generated friends there, so that when you start out, you can you can immediately talk to someone. But yeah, you can you can talk with other people too. Um, okay, and Pinterest kind of works the same. So again, um, yeah, I, I will just show you here. So Pinterest here with them.
categories and user directories and everything. Everything's and um, so so for us the, the the message was really where is what is an actual innovative thing or how 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 do these things come together? Who makes them up in their minds and what gets on the cover of Wired magazine and, and how and why didn't that happen back then? You know, why, why did no one make Google Plus 1997 when Netscape was absolutely capable of doing it? I mean, of course, it would crash like every 10 minutes or so, but that was, um, people were used to that anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, so, um, and, and this is also to, to understand like what does, what does history mean in, when it comes to computers? Because computers, computer history is often um, put together as something like, oh yeah, there was this great inventor and then they invented the Google algorithm and then they invented the floppy drive and then they invented this or that, but it's not really, you know, it's, it's not really what, what matters so much. So, for example, you could actually sit in front of a Windows 95 computer today and use it. Um, it just looks a bit weird, the buttons look strange. Uh, if you're used to a Macintosh and the resolution is uh, low, but the concepts are basically the same as what we do now. Uh, what we use now, what I have here is, is like 8K, whatever computer. Um, then there is um, this piece which I will only show partly, which is um, Olya Lianina's self-portrait. And this is a portrait that is distributed across three networks. Um, so here this is um, HTTP, like classic net, this is on the Tor network, like on the um, encrypted anonymous Tor network, where you can also buy, I don't know, Pikachu figures, uh, counterfeit Pikachu figures. <laughs> and, um, and there's Beaker Browse, which is a peer-to-peer -peer protocol. So what I would need to do to see this whole project, um, so when I'm looking at this now, I'm only seeing part. I'm seeing part of the self-portrait. And I would have to install two other browsers and arrange them on my screen to see the full, uh, full self-portrait. Um, and again, this is the idea is probably that uh, the web in itself is not necessarily a fixed thing or a product, or that it, it requires a lot of assembly. And I think the that is something that is attempted to be hidden uh, in in many uh, in many of the websites that try to look in a certain way, that try to look productive, that try to look like an app, and so forth. Yeah, again. I can show you only so much. You have to install Tor browser and Beaker browser by yourself. I'm not giving it away. Okay. Yeah. And here is um, this is I, I dug this picture out of a performance that I had at 2005 at Dage Projects in New York, um, where we had also yeah this is this is where when I when I had my band still we were just two people though, um, so we were harmony singing to um, soundchip basically. Soundchip music, but we had the computer as a as a partner in the band basically. So we were. I mean, at that time it was like you were this person that was behind the laptop, but we actually showed what was the music software doing in real time on the screen instead of like treating it as something that has to be hidden. <clears throat> okay. Ah, oh, yeah, and here you can click on this link later. There you can find the procrastination for kinds of forth. But I don't have time for that. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I, I will try to go through this a little bit quicker because I've, I've touched on many of the things already before. But this is um, Lexikon der Datenverarbeitung, so Lexikon of uh, IT, basically from 1969, and this is. Um, what I really like here is that it's full of lol, so it's lol, 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 lol all the way. Um, <laughs> instead of 0101, and that's something that has really, um, that has really fascinated me, because there are no numbers in the computer, that's what I learned. Um, there are only symbols in the computer. The computer is a symbol processing machine, and a symbol, I mean, for symbols to work you need to be able to differentiate symbols, you need to differentiate, be able to differentiate two symbols, and by that you can express anything else, basically. That's like the, the, the most core form of symbol identification, is you can two, tell two things apart. So that's the, how this works, and they decided to represent it with 0 and L, or O and L, for whatever reason I wasn't able to find out. It just seemed to be standard at that point in time, and today you have 0 and 1 as if the, com I mean, Mathematical calculation was only the first 
widespread use for a computer. Uh, excuse me, for a computer. It's not necessarily, and that's also how the computer got its name, but it's not necessarily what the computer is. It's not, necess it's not, not necessarily something to do with numbers. They are just easy to represent in that with the law. <clears throat> okay, here, um, 1981, uh, Xerox um, revealed the Star Computer, Xerox Star Computer, which was the first one that used the metaphors, the desktop metaphors that we are used to now from the office. Um, like files, folders, um, spreadsheets, and you see, it, it was Xerox after all, they needed a device um, that they could sell a freshly invented laser printer, basically. <laughs> so you needed to be able to send some pixels into the laser printer so that you get the perfect printout. So they needed a, a, a computer that would be able to design these things. And so the idea was like the, the paper is the exact size when you print it out as it is on screen. So you could hold it in front of the screen and it would be the exact size. Um, that's of course kind of cool. But this is basically also the metaphors that are prevalent in digital archiving until today. It's basically that there are files and there are a bunch of files and you need to put your files away and can you hand over the files for this artwork and so forth. I mean, this is a relatively, it's a, it's a fun history how it came together, but it could also have been different. Um, th I mean, there are some younger people nowadays who don't even know what a file is because they've never seen one. They just, they, they grew up with mobile phones or touch devices who at some point, someone at Apple decided files is too much for people to manage. It's like too complicated. You just don't get them. You just scroll endlessly through photos and they're like all through contacts or so. You do, you don't even see how many there are because you are endless scrolling and so forth. <clears throat> okay, cuneiform tablet. I hate cuneiform tablets with a passion, but only from a preservation perspective, of course, because they are always again used as a metaphor. And a lot of Silicon Valley digital preservation works like this. We need to invent like the digital cuneiform tablet, which means usually itching the bits of a file into a nickel disk and shooting it into the orbit of Neptune or something. And then it will be there forever, and that's preservation. Um, the, so I, I find this, of course, very strange, because when you think about how cuneiform tablets were actually preserved, it's usually they were, I mean, this is soft material, Something is etched in it. This is like saying you owe the state like four bulls and one sheep and stuff like that. So it's essentially a spreadsheet. But it was usually um, hardened when the archive burned down, and, <laughs> and it was it was burned, right? Um, and it it also survived so long because it was trash. I mean, you couldn't. You, you couldn't reuse it for anything. It was burned, so it wasn't soft anymore. You couldn't erase it and write something new on it. So, well, so let's produce a lot of trash that will survive. I mean, I, I guess that's true. So if you want to make really durable art, I don't know, make plastic bottles or whatever. So, um, <clears throat> and here, yeah, I, I, I put Excel here too. So is Excel a cuneiform tablet in digital form? Of course not, right? Because Excel can calculate by itself and it, it does, you can use the formulas and everything and you can say how many bulls does this farmer actually owe the state and how many sheep and if he pays us five sheep and how many bulls is that worth and so forth. Excel can figure that out for you. <clears throat> and so, yeah, but Excel is also often the, just, just think, I mean Excel is something extremely boring and everything but it's, it's a, like a staple of human culture. So. <laughs> um, so how would you preserve an Excel sheet? Is the Excel sheet separatable from Excel itself, right? Yeah, oh yeah. Okay, I, I, will, not, I will not go into this. But this, I mean, this is how Windows used to look when Excel 5 was around. And now, um, yeah, okay. This is important because the idea that files and spreadsheets and documents are represented as little images this comes from the Xerox computer, but here um, what Windows innovated kind of was that also software itself is represented as little icons. That was, I mean, uh, that was something that on the Xerox computer there was no software, there was just files and everything was built in. You couldn't install a new version of the program so everything was like fixed. Um, and so that comes from that time, I mean, a Apple had these ideas too. And 
um, in the 80s. And so here um, we have now, and we have a metaphor of software on a, on a new device. We have a metaphor of what software used to be, which is again, you know, which is like a, a metaphor chain, basically. So this is like, Okay, what do people know? People know that little pictures on the screen are software, so they can do something with it and it opens up. And this pretends like that this is software. It's, it's, to it's a totally different type of software, because on Excel is like totally located on my computer, and I can take it and put it into a trash can, and then it's actually erased from the disk and things like that. But all of these apps that I use today, they are basically, the computing happens somewhere else. This is just like a metaphor for what used to... I mean, I, I find it interesting that a, a system from here, like 2010, uses metaphors for a system from like the 1990s, basically. And um, I'm, especially, I'm especially obsessed here about the, the mirror effects here. Here, I zoomed into that. I'm sorry for the JPEG artifacts. Um, because the mirror basically says, this is here. This is like an actual thing, this has volume, this, is, this exists. Um, and of course that's just a metaphor so that you're not afraid. It's like, oh, where are my photos actually going? They're going wherever, I don't know, yeah? So there is some face detection algorithm working somewhere on them, I don't know. Yeah, so, but this is all, all to, to make the bridge, always to, to make the next bridge. Um, and, but now we are, I mean, this, this is how Instagram used to look, if you remember that, like the, the icon. And, um, but this is now also moving away from that. So Instagram is not trying to be your photo camera anymore, or a replacement for your photo camera, but it's something completely abstract. It's becoming an activity. It's basically becoming a way to do stuff. It's like a brand on human behavior. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and I, I find this here, this is probably, I, I think this is a, this is, in one, in certain ways it's very honest. That's what I like about it. Okay, so when you think about how do you, as, as Lyle also said in the beginning, how do you hold a collection of net art? And I have struggled with this idea of what is a collection or an archive or things that are, um, that are embodied in some way. That is, in, when, when it comes to net art, it's kind of limiting. Because you always have to think about, I have the Excel spreadsheet, let's say, or I have the virtual reality artwork, I have all the models and I know how big they are and so forth, but they don't do anything by themselves. They are basically just illegible symbols on a, on a disk, more or less. And um, I have, I don't know, I thought like, oh yeah, I see, let's call it performative archiving or wow, 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 whatever. But I've, I stumbled across this book here by Diana Tyler, The Archive and the Repertoire, which is about um, there are some, some great chapters in there about Mexican culture and how um, certain religious practices survived the Spanish invasion of Mexico under the cover of like Christianity. <laughs> and, um, and there's also an interesting discussion about the preservation of Princess Diana, basically, um, or the, the, the rituals that have emerged around Princess Diana. I, I just was in a in a do and read, and there was Princess Diana was on the cover of some magazines still, and I mean that's like that's amazing. So um, the there is that is that is something that is fully performative. So uh, how how a, lot, how a lot of the like the the knowledge of, for example, all these peoples that have been eradicated by Spanish culture. Uh, I mean this book goes into detail how this actually happened and how how the, the mixes went on and so forth, but um, how, how these things were uh, perpetuated was through repetition, through like constant performance, through, through redoing things in certain ways, maybe just like religious festivities or so. And that doesn't, and there's also a lot of variability into that. So I thought, um, and, and I thought about also coming back from, uh, thinking back about um, being a musician and performing with instruments and, um, that instruments being computers too. It's also that every performance should be a little bit different because then all the, the fans that we had of course that would travel behind us and wanted to see every show. I mean that's not true, but the, <laughs> but the, um, 
every show needs to be different because if there's no interaction with the audience, then basically you could listen to a record, right? And so I thought about the idea of the repertoire being much more um, productive when it comes to preserving digital artifacts. Even if it's a, let's say, even if it's a digital video, if you want to be able to view the digital video and have and view it in a certain context, it has to be um, reenacted. Even if you're just double clicking it and VLC player is going on, and in the future it's another VLC player. But maybe that VLC player was a big part of how you seen that video. For example, when you think about how um, a lot of people consume uh, cinem cinematic movies today, it's like on illegal streaming sites with a lot of nasty commercial banners around the movie. And that is that that would be something. Um, very special in the future, how, how someone is remembering the film and what, how, how films are in, in general viewed. And I mean the film in that case also being a metaphor for it, you know, something that used to be a thing at one point. So, um, oh this picture is upside down. <laughs> okay, um, so Lyle has mentioned um, Rhizome and I mean we had this program, the Netherlands Anthology, where in two years we put out and uh, went like from the 80s uh, to today through the history of internet art and put out one artwork every week, so 100 pieces in two years. That was in incredibly stressful. But also we had the um, a lot of preservation work had to be done because some of the works that were really key to the history of that field just don't exist anymore or are not accessible anymore and so forth. And there's a catalog for that too, and in the last pages we have put a huge grid that explains what preservation action was taken on each of the pieces. Because, or restoration actions, it's also on Google Drive here. And yeah, I really, I'm really proud of this spreadsheet because of all the colorful checkboxes. <laughs> so, <laughs> but also, um, what we have what, we, what I have noticed when it comes to, to approaches to preservation of digital artifacts and especially ones that contain software that have their own performatic uh, appearance um, is that either it is printed out and stored as a PDF, like that's the, the classic archival case, or museums go in and say, okay, we have to start from zero. We have to start from zero. Like, what is the processor in the artist's computer? And the artist usually says, uh, I ordered it online, I don't know. I mean, I, um, I don't know, I just used what was pre-installed in that computer. I didn't install it myself. And I, oh, strange, where is the artistic intention? And, you know, where is the code? The code is where the artist, like, inscribes their, um, inscribes their artistic spirit. Into, I mean, this is, I mean, I, I, I just try to show you with this, with this um, series of images, what an, let's say I'm an amazing artist, let's say I'm a virtual reality artist from the 2000s, let's say I'm Jeffrey Shaw, right? Um, Jeffrey Shaw's work, doing a virtual reality installation, the, if, if, you, if you look at what's on the Silicon Graphics computer basically, before Jeffrey Shaw touched it, it's like so much. Then Jeffrey Shaw touches it and then it's like so much. <laughs> so, the, the, the question is not that this materiality, Right or like, what is the what is the what is the thing that I can put in storage? That's not that's not how this works. So we have decided we need to find to get through 100 works and not go crazy is to define abstractions that that work on these insights and that are. Uh, translatable to a lot of different works, but without like trying to normalize everything into a PDF. And so, so we are kind of in between a library. A library sees everything as a book or everything as a PDF or an ebook or whatever. That's like the ideal library object, which is fully standardized. Um, and then there is performance art, which like goes away once the performance is over. Uh, and museums kind of some, sometimes also treat net art, for example, or software art, like a performance, so once it's over, so it's, it's more event-based, let's say. But in fact, net art is, is kind of in between the both. So there are artifacts that you encounter online 
they are embedded in a huge like performative space. Things happen basically even when you're not looking, and <laughs> so there is an object component to it, and there is a performative. So it, it's really it's really in between, um, and that's also why these in between solutions and like abstractions need to be thought of. So we had uh, so for example. We also at some sometimes we just can say there's just documentation because everything is just so gone and all we have is a crappy JPEG from I don't know some gallery opening that someone made with a cool pix Casio camera and <laughs> which was which was super nice uh, and adequate um, but yeah especially and that's especially challenging today when artists work. Uh, create works on the internet and they don't own the data themselves but they do a performance let's say on Instagram or they do a performance on Facebook or they do what other crazy things they do. I, will, I, I think I can show an example. So this is how this works. You can store artifacts. You need to be able to recreate a performance. This is what we did with the Windows 95 emulators basically. Yeah? If you ever played a Game Boy game on your um, MacBook Pro G9000, I don't know, then that's an emulator. And you can do the same with Windows 95 and so forth. And so that is the object. An artifact that is enacted through a, through a performance, that is the object. So the, the file is not the object. That's basically, that's basically the huge insight. <laughs> Files are a small component, component of this. So, when is something preserved then? In the when I I consider something preserved when it's when its behavior is reproducible. So, I don't only have the file, but I have a software environment, let's say, that I also need to preserve separately, like the Windows 95 environment with Netscape in it, that can enact the thing that I actually have. Um, I need to be able to define the variability and the blurriness of an item, of an, of an object. And blurriness is exactly that. So there are things that I can actually, I can't hold them in my hand because they're just software, but um, I can copy a file to my computer and have it. But I can't go to Instagram and ask them, can I get a copy of Instagram? That's not possible. But there are artists that work like with, you know, 500 Instagram accounts and linking in between them and I mean, there's a, there's a version of my boyfriend came back from the war recreated on Instagram, but it's just linking in between different Instagram accounts. Because that's the only link that you can put on Instagram, actually. It's like, link another person, and that other person is only one image. And then there's different people tagged on that, and so forth. So. <clears throat> and fungibility, fun fungibility, I don't know how to say it. Fungibility? Fungibility means that the computer that you have right now is going to be broken, and so you need systems in place that this, all, this, all these environments that you've put together, all the, the blurriness that you've taken into account and maybe captured in certain ways on, or like flattened in certain ways, this needs to be portable across different systems, which also goes against a lot of museum logic, where you're um, usually acquiring a piece and it's an edition one of three and it's that one computer and then you, of course, you can't make a copy because it's like, you know, you can't just copy it. There, there was nothing signed by the artist that, it, that you're allowed to copy it. No. <clears throat> so yeah, there's, there's many of these structural problems. Okay, so now I want to give an example of how this worked out for Alex Galloway, Mark Tribes, who is now at the philosophy department here, as you might know. And um, Martin Wattenberg, they created Starry Night in 1999, which was a um, which was an interface to Rhizome's mailing list system. Um, so the, the Rhizome, Rhizome started as a mailing list actually in 1996 where there was nothing happening but like, um, like computer artists uh, talking to each other, maybe similar to The Thing or Earthling or things like that. And, um, and then different interfaces were created to that, to that message base, to, that, to all these messages that were exchanged. And one of these was, um, and that, be that became really iconic for Rhizome, was that every message is a star, and depending on what topics were discussed in that message, the stars would form um, zodiac signs, or how they're called, constellations. constellations. You could then click on the star and read the message. 
and then you would see like how it's, it's like an alternative way of browsing and browsing a message archive. And I mean, it's it's very beautiful, and especially back in the day, it was absolute, absolute mind blowing. Um, the um, the fun thing is that of course Rhizome lost all his messages. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know when it happened. It was of course before my time, but. Um, Something went wrong, they were deleted, no one had them. Um, what we had was a Java applet uh, that, you know, doesn't work anymore um, on, on today's computers and so forth. So I put together a Windows 2000 environment, put Internet Explorer 6 inside with a Java applet, uh, with, with a Java engine, have the Java, uh, Java engine play that applet, but now I needed to get the data. So this applet was poking around the internet like rhizome.org <laughs> but from my perspective if it could have been any other website that I have no control over because that data was gone. The software that would interface with this thing was gone. So I looked at the, the network traffic, what is this asking for? And by that I was able to reproduce like a fake server with messages that um, yeah, Martin Wattenberg had for test purposes on some old hard disk. Um, he wanted to do another interface. Uh, I, actually, it was the spiral interface. There was another other interface with all the messages. And for that, he had uh, a, a body of samples to work with. And these are basically the stars that you can still see. But that, that server, it, this is an, that server that, didn't, that doesn't exist anymore, that's an example of blurriness. Because I have no idea what was on this server, um, except for these messages where they should be. But I don't have the full breadth of it. Basically, I'm creating a, a simulation, something very flat. So there is no real computer on the other end that would do all these complicated web server things. It's just a web archive that always gives back the same information. And so, so we have the we have like the item, we have the thing that is performing again, and now we have the blurriness. And the fungibility in this case is that this was represent this was presented in an emulator on the internet. And the same emulator, like the exact same one, I needed I needed to make no um, changes to it. it. Was also shown in as the NetArt Anthology exhibition in the New Museum, and we have developed a. Yeah, I mean, this has developed over several stages with other exhibitions that I had done before. But you see here, there is. What is this thing doing? It's really annoying. Um, this is a a legacy, like an original from that time screen, but the computer. This is like some modern. Nook computer, like a, a mini office computer. So to get to get it look the right way, of course we we want to have that screen. I mean that's something nice you want to look at in the gallery. But I'm not pretending that this is like a, the actual thing. The, it was also important that we had here the the stand with the computer on is, is transparent so that you can see that it's actually that is like yeah a, a transparent situation. It was also clear that this is not connected to the internet. Um, there's just a mouse and you can click on these things. <clears throat> okay, oh yeah, the full installation is pretty nice. Here, see? So yeah, we, we presented two artworks that way, like, like legacy websites that used all of these things like Flash, Shockwave, Java, and so forth. Okay. <clears throat> Show this this artwork, which is which is a book. <laughs> so uh, again, also to to understand what, what can you what can you see as the network, or what can you see as a as an as a I don't know a stage for art basically. So this book has been released by the Swiss um, like net art group. I would almost say Mediengruppe Bitnik from Zurich. And this is like their monography of all the things they've done. And the title of the book is ac ac actually this. So this is this is a script alert parenthesis everything meeting group Bitnik and so forth. So this is like actual computer code. This is um, this is a very simple JavaScript that they have chosen as the title, um, and they did that on purpose. So uh, I have some. Because if that book is displayed in certain bookstores online, that script is executed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 
So, um, uh, of course, these bookstores have fixed that problem in the meantime, right? But I've, I was able to use our web archiving tool, Web Recorder, which we really developed for such things. We can't go to the bookstore and say, can you give us our website with all that shitty code that they exploited here? But um, we, can, we can go to, to it and like capture it, capture it in that moment, and including all the scripting that goes on. So here, there's actually the embedded content. Also, so here, it would usually say, of course, Buchhandlung Walter König, um, which is like a major um, like art book uh, publisher and book uh, bookstore chain. So it, it would bring up this alert, an alert box. So that's the, that's the code. Okay, and, you see, and it comes up a few times because the title is in the page a few times. Really like that. Um, and here, now you can buy it. Um, so, and here this is another example from Saxo, um, from Denmark. There's like a lot here. You have to click a lot of, okay, a lot of times. Like, I'm not sure if I will ever be able to finish it. <laughs> Seems like, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. We are getting there. And you see, you see like this site has been totally destroyed to... <laughs> Um, this is also beautiful by Bocus. Yeah. Here was just one alert. And so forth, yeah. Here. <laughs> really like it. So it's also good if you search for certain things and it appears in like recommended and you didn't even ask for it and you're still getting these alerts. Um, and here, oh yeah, this is especially nice. Yeah. So they didn't even have an image for the book yet, but they had the title, and it like it like worked. Um, so what has happened here? So what kind of network is this acting on? And if you think about, yeah, you can you can do things on the web, of course. You can get your own domain name. You can publish things there too. Um, you can you can maybe post a certain image to Instagram that makes that that tries to um, work with its surroundings that tries to maybe duplicate Instagram interface elements or something. Um, what they did is like they registered the book title with just with ISBN. ISBN is like this, this global registry of books. Uh, titles, authors, publishing date, a standardized database that is um, available across the world. And where all uh, booksellers are basically drawing from automatically. They would be stupid if they wouldn't do that. So what has happened now to this book? the ISBN record was actually changed. So that um, because of this thing, because of this book title, so if I'm looking now for meeting group with Nick here, um, you've seen the title, the title doesn't contain the script, the script tag and the alert. It's not just called meeting group with Nick. Yeah? So I think that is, that, and and that, is, um, that, I think, illustrates amazingly well what is the, the object part of it and what's the performance part of it. Yeah. And, yeah, apart from it, one of, my, one of my favorites recently, from 2017, this work. <clears throat> it, unfortunately, it can only be done once. So <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's like, it's, it's, a, it's an unreproducible performance in a way. But at least I was able with this web recorder tool, right, to reproduce it in a limited way, and I can do that once a year and celebrate um, celebrate ISBN net art, basically. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think I think that's that's all I have to say. Um, this is my email address, <laughs> and. This thing here is also this is just a, a pad that you can that you can go in and make edits into. So you can also here if you want to make some notes or I, yeah. This is um, and take of course out the links. Look at the images again and so forth. So the address is I'll put that um, here on top. That it's bigger. That's 
that's it. It's also very easy to remember, I think. I can email it out to everyone. Yeah. Now what I was actually hoping is that everyone's taking pictures of the UI Alex. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that too. That's like how you remember things nowadays. Okay. okay. Questions? Yeah, please. Well, it's not it's not a question, it's just basically uh kind of been thinking about archaeology all the time and the Archaeology, yeah. Yeah, and the, and the exotic element of the past of time in the in, in, when we look at uh, pieces from the past. Yeah. So the pattern of the past of time. Yeah. Maybe we like more of that than the actual original piece, uh, who knows, right? But what, what you've been uh, showing here is kind of like uh, maintaining that um, Yeah, I think I think things like uh, I mean, there's a lot of no, like nostalgia, but what Lyle also mentioned before, um, for example, around Windows 95, when you just think about the wave the wave movement, or um, once I once I had a, I had a class um, where I was teaching students how to install Windows 95 in an emulator, and they were totally hyped up because they wanted to. They wanted to draw something with Microsoft Paint, that that legendary software, you know, that only exists in in fairy tales, and, uh, and and that was a that was an exciting moment because I think there is um, there is a, a big difference when you think about a, a thing that has patina, that is that you ex exactly dig out, and something that is a practice like a ritual that that you want to Reperform. So of course Windows 95 looks old, <laughs> but you can still use it. You can still draw something in Microsoft Paint. And yeah, what I especially liked about that class was they drew something in Microsoft Paint, then photographed it off screen and posted it on Instagram. And I think that's that's like preservation. <laughs> that's how it works. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just find it how interesting how different it is between the fine art space and the digital space where it's almost like you cheat it, you use Photoshop. I just think it's so different. Especially with younger artists too, where like digital art is like their way to do it. Uh, yeah. Um I, I I'm sorry I didn't understand but you fully um, but you mentioned that the younger artists are more used to making copies and creating digital also illustrations, like that's the standard, that's what you were saying. Yeah, um, I I think that's right, and I think also that many um, institutions haven't adopted to that when it comes to preservation. Um, uh, I find I find it, for example, interesting knowing knowing how a lot of web designers work. Um, so, web designers usually they design a website for a client, and it's really beautiful and nice. Then they hand it over to the client, and the client totally destroys it. So, <laughs> because they have like no taste, they didn't, they, they hire someone new who does the copywriting or whatever. And so, the, so web designers take screenshots of their websites and put them in their portfolio like on the first day when they still look good. And <laughs> in the hope that someone, they will find someone who finally understands them and doesn't destroy them. And so on. But um, a web design, and, and I think that is, that is also a very interesting challenge because Something that artists face in a familiar way, maybe, but for, for designers it's very um, tangible. Uh, I would hope that, that I would see also the interactions in, in the portfolio, like how do you navigate for it, how do these things behave when I use the mouse or when I touch it. But I, I get a screenshot and that is kind of, that is kind of um, unsatisfactory, with, especially with you know, web designers who I know who are very savvy and are have have done some amazing stuff, but then you just get a screenshot in the end. Yeah, yeah they're gone. Uh, the, the, can we talk politics for a minute? Um, I'm sure about the early web and some of the stuff that you've done in the past. And part of the, uh, let's not call it nostalgia, but part of the impetus, I think, to 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 do this archaeology is a uh, kind of appreciation for. You might say the political situation of the early web in terms of creativity, in terms of kind of individual initiative and the possibilities for essentially people to create their own stuff outside of, you might say, some sort of corporate model. Maybe that's the nostalgia part. 
Um, how do you see that? Do you see this as sort of a political engagement on your part when we're talking about that kind of preservation? Um, yeah, um, most definitely. I think that's how I, how I, I don't know, made the decision that I wanted to go into preservation. Is um, I first I have to get something out of the way. So I'm totally anti-nostalgia. Nostalgia is poison. So <laughs> it's a. Uh, um, uh, it is it is exactly what what happens when you think about you look at the old web like you look at GeoCities. I mean Ge GeoCities is basically the GeoCities project that Olya and me did, and I, I created a, a system that creates these screenshots. Oh, I'm sure you know it. Everyone knows it. We have like fifty thousand followers. Um, but I mean, it's of course on this dying platform. Yeah, here. So that's a. That's a, a robot basically that uses an emulator and goes through the archive of GeoCities pages that we have a local copy of that was created in, in 2009, the, the copy when GeoCities was destroyed. Um, and so this is, this is, um, we had found a very, um, <laughs> we had found a very appreciative audience on Tumblr where, where a lot of, yeah, visually, Visual culture interested folks were around, and this is posting one screenshot every 20 minutes, and we have material, I think, for nine more years. Um, so there is a lot of great stuff on it. There's also a lot of bad stuff on it, and and um, so some some of it is very very touching, and you can basically see the the seeds of the fully industrialized internet on there. I mean, someone back then has looked for all of this and said, okay, people want to post baby pictures, so I will make postbabypictures.com. And that, in the next iteration, became MySpace, and that then became Instagram or something like that. Yeah. But um, indeed, there is, a, there is another role assigned to users in, in that part of the web, um, which is that you you, base, you build the web yourself. You're not going somewhere that's already where the table is already set for you, but you are building it yourself. There was, they came to an empty space and had to do something on their own. And of course, um, no, none of them, or very little of them, had any design background or any sense of, I don't know. It is, it is um, there was also no photos because there were no digital cameras, they only had scanners and sometimes there's a photo on the page like, yeah, I finally got the scanner and here's the photo that you've been waiting for. Maybe, I don't know, five people have been waiting for it or so. And um, that's the, the, the theater the theater performance that Lyle talked before, uh, um, that was at the kitchen, that was also about getting a scanner basically to put a photo on a website. But the um, GeoCities was also not good. GeoCities wasn't good. Uh, what we don't get here is like some of the commercial banners that were injected everywhere. GeoCities change their terms of service like all the time. Um, the service broke, people lost their data, they forgot their passwords, had no ways for recovering them and so forth and so forth. You can read all these stories on the old GeoCities pages too. It's like, I'm done with this and I'm getting my own domain. And then you look at this old domain, uh, at, at their own domain, which is like, I don't know, jennifer.zoom.com or something and then you look and it's, it's gone and there's nothing left of it on GeoCities, we still have Jennifer's rant, how much he hates GeoCities. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, I think the, uh, what has been taken away from computer users but um, internet users largely is uh, a history of what is a user. Or where are we coming from as users? Because the, the Silicon Valley speak is also like, there are no users, users is a bad word, makes you think about shooting drugs or something. But I mean, user is just someone who uses something, or there's an end user who gets a product and consumes it, and they say, no, we are all just people. But I mean, we are not all just people. There are some incredibly rich folks in Silicon Valley that produce the crap software that we have to use every day. And we don't have any say in it, actually. We are not friends, we are not, <laughs> we are not all just people. Uh, I found this also, this language is so hilarious when you think about the Libra announcement, the Libra announcement from Facebook, like the cryptocurrency, it's like, this is just like friends making a phone call across borders. No, it's like moving your money offshore. <laughs> but, the, um, but yeah, at, the, at least at that point in time, 
this Jennifer that I was talking about said, I'm fed up with GeoCities, I'm going somewhere else, that's not possible anymore, first of all. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm on all, on like many alternative networks like Scuttlebutt and Mastodon, and I mean, I can only uh, say, yeah, you should look at those too, they're pretty interesting. Uh, but uh, I mean, you, you can like talk to 10 people there. <laughs> Otherwise, they're great. Um, also, almost no Nazis. So, um, but the, um, uh, but the, um, uh, yeah, the role that the user had over certain points in time was that there were, there were different playgrounds given to users where they could express themselves. And for example, on GeoCities, people were encouraged to write their own HTML code, and you can find their uh, tons of like the pro proverbial grandmother. Um, the, the pro oh, I don't know if, that's, if that works like that. The proverbial grandmother that has no idea about computers, but she's um, making her own web page in Microsoft Notepad uh, to showcase pictures of her uh, of her of her kids and of her kids' kids. How are they called? The kids' kids? Um, grand grandkids. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, this is also good. Anime. Anime and. <laughs> southern, <laughs> southern flag, really good. Yeah, and you see, like for example, this seems to, um, this seems to be like where is the place nowadays where you put stuff like that? I mean, probably Facebook, um, like Boomer Facebook, kind of looks like this, I think. But yeah, the users, users were encouraged to build a web because there was nothing there. There wasn't the. They, they had to invent their own visual, visual language, and they had to to invent their own visual alphabet, and they actually copied around a lot of um, lot of items because it was incredibly difficult to create an animated GIF of a cat walking back and forth. So today, it's just like snatched from TV. Yeah, so there are loops made from TV, and they're not even looping well because the TV show wasn't made for looping. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and I think it is important that. Um, that users get an understanding of what has the role of users been, how has the role of users changed, who is like on the other side, who is producing this stuff, who is creating the playgrounds that we are supposed to enjoy, and um, what could have gone differently, or what, what could have been an alternative. Because at the moment everything looks like, okay, so shall we, I mean, I'm, I'm, just as Car Cartago should be destroyed, I think Facebook should also be destroyed in a way, but then a lot of people will lose contact with each other, so it's like we are kind of in a situation where, um, where it seems like you can, you, you need to reflect and look back and see what could have, how did we end up here and how could it have gone differently. And that's important for artists too. Um, for example, when you think how Samsung, Facebook, uh, HTC, how they pushed out the virtual reality headsets, to whom they pushed out the virtual reality headsets, to like classic artists, to painters, to, you no, know, because like when you type in art on Google, then paintings appear, so they say, okay, this is how we do it. Um, or they, they work with, I don't know, Jeff Koons or Abramovich or so forth. When there is a lush history of practice, and I don't know, a thousand people they could have asked that would have produced really great stuff for virtual reality. <laughs> who already know how this works, who have experience with it, and you know, and then, um, but there, it's, when this history is not accessible, then I can't blame Samsung. If they would type in VR out into Google, something should appear from, like, something they could maybe um, contact, but it's not the case. Or, or, they, or they get a GIF of that size from some, yeah, installation with Ars Electronica 1997 or so. <clears throat> I just want to make one, one more point. Apropos this, this last point you brought up, which I think is crucial, mm -hmm. and that is your discussion about the inadequacy of the history of the web as a sort of, just as a sort of technological progress, where basically we're going to talk about the history of, you know, the development of software, or we're going to talk yeah. about the history of like basically hardware innovation, seems to me to parallel exactly what happened in the, in the, the descriptive histories of photography itself. Mm -hmm where what you get was, you know, again, a history of technological advance. And mm -hmm. that substituted for any genuine history of sort of, of the user, which is what both this mm -hmm. needs to be and what the history of photography has to be. Yeah. 
got to be about the user. Yeah, I think I think the, or the audience, whatever you want. To yeah, call the, the, the parallels I think in between these forms is interesting because there was always the the machine of the, like the camera, just like like a computer is here. That was also a mass manufactured device, and um, of course it is very easy to describe like different models and what were the lens distortions and things like that. And then how this there, there's a lot of technical ter determinism going on in in. Um, like when describing how the web works, also probably in photography. I mean, I have no idea yeah, about photography. Absolutely. Yeah, and um, and the, the uh, for when when you look about look at how technical innovation is um, actually uh, I don't know pushed pushed out. It is there is always this idea of disruption, and this is something that has never been there before. But then I I have it, and in the end, oh wow, I can send a text message to someone else. And the speech bubbles have another color. That's like innovation. But now the network is called Peach, or the network is called I don't know, Ello, or the network is called something, Facebook Messenger. <laughs> and um, that is, um, uh, I think it's it's very critical critical to to understand this and also to have the to have the the things ready and to have them ready to be used so that you can. Compare so, for example, I have, we have an artwork that um, I will see if I can find this real quick, um, and if it works here, uh, because also Photoshop was brought up just before. Um, <clears throat> there is this piece. Um, we have it here, Heritage Gold, by the UK group Mongrel. This is a. Um, this is a, uh, so, wish me luck that it works here. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you get me at a very unfortunate time. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't seem to work. I will, use, I will try to use the European node. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, does it work? Uh, bad. I know I should have tried it before. Um, okay, so what this work basically is, yeah, we are at the moment changing the emulation, emulation infrastructure to be able to speak HTTPS. Oh, what's happening? Is there something going on? No, okay. Yeah, so and this, is still, this is still on the old infrastructure, so I need to port it over in the process of that. But what this work is, it's, um, it's a hacked version of Photoshop, um, three point something, and um, it, you can load uh, um, grayscale images of faces, and all the all the menu options in Photoshop have been replaced like with, with racial terms. So you can say like in, increase whiteness or um, uh, what is it? Get college degree, and then everything gets white. And, and so it's a it's a it, I mean it's it's just like I, I mentioned it because Photoshop is kind of part of this work. And so it was distributed on a diskette. Um, and um, if you look at Photoshop now and back then, okay, Photoshop now is like inverted colors and it's dark and the icons are white. But basically, it's pretty much the same. I mean, it didn't have layers. Otherwise, yeah. And it was it's most, much easier to modify, too. <laughs> it, fit, it fit on a diskette. Yeah, I'm, I'm now really annoyed with this, that this didn't work. Um, I know there's another URL where it's, which is my test setup, which I know that works, but I, I, I'm just, yeah, I forgot to, to take that with me. I can send it to you. It's, it's definitely, if you're into Photoshop, this is a great piece. <laughs>